Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Fresh Off the Press book talk. This is part of a new series of virtual events featuring National Humanities Center fellows discussing their recent published works. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. Before we get started, I want to remind you that to participate in the discussion, you'll need to log into YouTube by clicking on the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page and entering your Gmail account. This evening, we'll be talking with literary scholar and poet Tsitsi Jaji, who was a fellow at the center in 2017 18. Tsitsi was born and raised in Zimbabwe before coming to the United States as an undergraduate, studying piano and literature at Oberlin College. She eventually earned her PhD in comparative literature from Cornell, but her interest in music continues to be reflected in her scholarship and her teaching at Duke University, where she is currently associate professor of English. Her book, Africa and Stereo, Music, Modernism, and Pan-African Solidarity, won the African Literature Association's first book prize, as well as honorable mentions from the American Comparative Literature Association and the Society for Ethnomusicology. She is currently at work on two new scholarly projects, Cassava Westerns, a study of how global Black writers and artists reimagine the American frontier myth to serve new local purposes, and Classic Black, a study of poetry set to music by Black concert music composers. In addition to her exceptional scholarly work, Tsitsi is an accomplished poet, and many of her poems are inspired by music and the experience of living in the diaspora. Tsitsi's poems have appeared in Harvard Review, the American, uh, I'm sorry, the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, Black Renaissance Noir, Almost Island, Prairie Schooner, and Bitter Oleander, among others. And she has given readings of her works at the Poetry Foundation, the Library of Congress, UNESCO, and the United Nations, along with many other venues. Her chapbook, Carnival, was included in the first new generation African poets box set. And Tsitsi's first full length collection of poems, Beating the Graves, was published in 2017 to rave reviews. And her second, Mother Tongues, appeared in 2019 to much acclaim, winning the Cave Conum Northwestern University Press Poetry Prize. She has kindly agreed to read to us from that collection this evening and to talk about her work. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tsitsi Jaji. Robert, thank you so much for uh, the generous introduction and more especially for the invitation that you and the entire um, community that is the National Humanities Center um, issued to each of us who's fortunate enough to be a resident um, uh, and to, I think, the wider world, an invitation in to what the stories, the histories, the imaginings um, that make us human um, can mean when we really mine those together. So it's really special to be here, really special to get to hold forth. <laughs> and um, I'm going to do uh, exactly what you said, a mixture of talking about the poems and where they come from and reading poems. And I'm gonna start with um, one of my favorites. Uh, my favorite poems are generally the shorter ones. And this one is dedicated to a friend who, like me, is a um, writer who lives inside the university world, um, R. Ellis Neira, um, a wonderful scholar of Latinx and Black poetry, in, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, R. Ellis Neira is their name. How I write. Now I see that my wilderness is our field, and I call my neighbor to come plow it with me. Our hoes 
dig deep. Our harvest spills over into something an awful lot like hope. I think that many of the poems that I write come with a, a, a interest in something one of my teachers in graduate school, Bill Kennedy, once said, which was that he made us think about the etymology of the word culture, which actually comes from the same root as cultivate, as in farming and land. And my family on both sides were farmers. And in fact, my grandparents um, on my father's side still um, uh, were farming as I was growing up and uh, farming with their hands and we learned to hoe, et cetera. And so the, the metaphors of cultivation run through many, many of my poems. And this collection, Mother Tongues, was also trying to figure out how to give an account of myself um, as somebody who writes in English, although my first language had been Shona um, growing up in Zimbabwe, uh, born while the war for independence was unfolding. Um, and the opening poem is very literally um, a narration, very clear to me, and in the way that poetry wonderfully is very obscuring <laughs> um, in the way that it clears the way and gives some permission. But it, it's a literal account of the, the scene in which English became the language I should speak and uh, uh, Shona no longer a given. Mother tongue. Mother of two, mixed and matched Ohio blonde, brings her brown babies, born to a brand new nation, home alone. Cash strapped, father of two, stays behind, husbanding their shared hearth. She tames the air-bound toddler boy on an elastic leash. In the airport, an unknown wasp waist girly woman squawks in alarm her blessedly untested parental principles. When boy won't budge, his corduroy seat sails across the waxed floors while sister does dragging duty, a trail of gleam in their wake. That sister's bush-born vernacular follows this proven logic with mother, speak mommy's talk. Otherwise, be at home in words. Fatherless for a spell, her tale of ups and downs and pressure and vomit in a paper bag wells up at the sight of the first matching man. Black is beautiful, powered by pride, wounded with each stop, blunted by each frisk. Black is the color of our first true love, Baba, warm heart beating to calm colic, nightmares, and memories flicker of something history will call Chimurenga. The language of home spills off daughter's tongue, drowning this unknown umber man whose skin is a flag of peace. His face laughs, bewilders, then unsettles in dread. White woman panic will bring only trouble. He harbors no desire for the body of this bronze girl child, no bride, no candy, no white van out back. Suddenly, he sees they look like family. Yet he can sight no ocean to wash them apart. Mother knows best, so sorry. Mother knows best. She clasps small brown hand in hers and smooths golden hair, head of spiral hair with a free hand. She spells out our new code. Everyone here speaks only mother's tongue. And now sister does too. End of story. It's the first poem in the book. It's just the beginning of the story. <laughs> um, uh, and there are many tributes to the, the originers, natives of, of language for me. And those are of course, um, my parents and my uh, legacies of poetry. Um, so I'm going to read two poems. Um, I've been reflecting today in particular about how on earth can I justify talking this much about myself, which is really what so many of these poems say. But I think it's because the self 
is um, is in and of itself really important. And when the self, sorry, the self has not existed per se in history in um, the the various iterations and concatenations that our identities are, I think it's really important to be able to hear those voices, not just those voices, but there is a sense in which there really um, hasn't been a time when the kinds of um, Baroque um, biographies that we're living, I think, have been possible, like that you could have a Youngstonian, um, uh, a Hararian um, musician, scholar, but that that's just an example um, and uh, a case study of, of what it means to be our full self. So I'm, I am going to read a lot of poems about myself. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and these ones are um, two in sequence, uh, bearing witness to my parents, um, who, like many in my generation, are aging, um, and in their case, uh, doing so with Alzheimer's. <clears throat> Daughtering. For my father, who remembers only what matters. When the dune crests, she finds she has too much body left. To reach the drowning fields, she will have to shed muscle, sheer breath, cap off her boyhood. This banter must shrivel into a loop of repeating wind rush, while the stutterer insists his thought would resurrect if only the other words would be still. She thinks her thighs have doubled, so she pours them down the drain. Now is the time to carry only what fits on her spine. There is more than one way to become an Amazon. If she plans to outlast the burials, she must level with the panther who deserted her before it showed her how to bear teeth. On the hunt, it always claimed the lightest foot, the surest kill. But this is madness. What stalks them now is not silence, but memory's sloth, giving its all away. She will need to stay here, fix her eyes. First, she must ease the steering wheel into the grave. She will need to stop wanting for time, stop fussing at what snaps or fumbles. When the wave crests, its litters silt, not gold. It was never going to end that way. Wealth feeds on decay like loam. To walk them away from the proof of that first Florida banana tree will be the true ruin to lay sack to a rhythm of roots, to grant neither net nor fountain sway, to give away the bed to the wrong person, to discover the table is unwanted, the cloth too unwanted, the cactus celebrating the wrong season. There will be nothing left to make a gift of. Still, she comes to share the palm with eyes like stones. Her spine must be her only flask. She sees the wisdom of black veiling lace. She sees there was never enough water. The sandy crest broke long before the first prophet lit up her hair. This is love. And they didn't die for my mother who has done all things well. I bring a squall of quiet, my hectoring force to shame the belated fog of orders and bandages into a fine mist. I am here to squelch reason's panic. Certainty is scrambled and we find only vaseline, thick with scent and too heavy to churn the waters. If they wept no tears, they would not know, I will not shed any. If there were no tremors, they would not know me, unshaken. 
I will outlive them. I will bury them in my question, what more? This is what we have done since before the border between wild and free was pinned like steel and plaster, animal and woman, birth and death. Only daughters are shouldered into becoming mother, cold, without children, colder still after birth. This is how it has always been. All we cannot know is when. I'm going to shift over to a really different set of um, uh, sources, and these are images um, that uh, come to me, I think, from closer to my scholarly life. Um, and uh, the first poem is written in response to the Malian uh, photographer Malik Sibibe. Um, many of you have probably seen some of his images, and I'll show you one in a second. Uh, but I will say that he is very um, special to me because uh, he gave permission for one of his images to be used as the cover image on my first book. And a dear colleague, um, Sherif Keita, um, uh, when he traveled to Mali, um, not long before Sidibe passed away, gave him a copy of my book. So I will introduce um, uh, him to those of you who don't know his work with this um, lovely image of Sherif speaking with him. And the book there is indeed African Stereo. That's the, the cover image from it. Um, but this uh, poem that I'm going to read for you is called Malik Sidibe's Camera Calls. And the uh, image of these dancing uh, young people here is very um, representative of one um, line of his work. He, he did go around to parties and um, take pictures for people um, as they were um, out enjoying what it meant to be young in a recently independent uh, nation. Mali had become independent in 1960. And <clears throat> that energy having uh, been born, you know, in time to overhear the uh, cheers of independence in Zimbabwe, I think is very nostalgic for me, not just in the imagery, but also in what that particular historical complex of feelings is. Malik Sidibe's camera calls. Come to me, all you ochred yellows and you swaths of indigo bled purple. You too poor for boo-boos and you cotton blenders. Clutch your full skirts, young women, or smooth the curves of your tayabas. The negative will drain whatever brassy print your tailor settled on and wash your sun skin bright. The darker the room, the groovier the glint of a flirting eye, a glossed nail, a lavish twist done just right. Nighttime is the right time to be young, gifted and black, to mash, grind, funk up the checkered floor and shake all living color off for the silvery surface of infinity. Hang here after the shoot, if you wish. The beat goes on. Another person of um, Sidi Bey's generation uh, who left a really big impression on me is uh, Teora Petse Kositsile, who was the poet laureate of South Africa, long time um, uh, ANC exile, who wrote along with many of the American writers of the Black Arts Movement. So, um, and one of his collections, um, My Name is Africa, had an introduction by Gwendolyn Brooks, just to give you a sense of the, the world in which he moved. He was uh, um, close to a number of, of um, Black arts movement poets and uh, later a real mentor to a lot of younger writers. When he passed away um, in, now I'm not sure, I think it was 2017, um, this poem came pretty quickly. Burying Willie, our lion, for 
Oprah will develop it so it's positive. Well, sweet being eater, you have come into your own. Your new den is a chamber of light, beef off of fat cats and liberated from the party magnets for the prophet's fright. With you there now, it is streaming with the plenty that has always been enough. You see, we see you sauntering among the lions and lionesses, nodding into each other's Solomonic eyes as you lie down to watch us from your dear one sanctuary. None this side of ever will hold a candle to your pride. But what you have given us, pride, paean, praise song, such words must now arm us with the miracle of future memory. We know how you be tonight, so we busy ourselves with your tasks, clasping hands with prisoners, kissing cheeks of madmen, spitting in the face of butchers and dancing revolutions with Nina, with Archie, with Jonas, A.B., Cassandra, Hugh, and Pharaoh Sanders. Oh, Brother Willie, our great lion, can you hear us roaring in sorrowing rage at time's cruel trade? To have known you, only to lose you, only to gain your ancestral embrace, our endless nobility, our most humble kin. Brawili was a small person. I am about five foot two, and I think I, I could look at him face to face. Um, and I remember um, being at a, a reading um, in New York where he um, talked about visiting a prison, a, a maximum security prison in South Africa um, soon after democracy, um, and sitting, holding hands with one of the, the prisoners. Um, and uh, just that this person had not had physical touch. And it was a very moving story, but I think partly because um, many of the, the, the words in this poem are actually borrowed phrases from some of his poems. And he had written with the simplest of diction um, and really complicated ideas about how time and ethics operate. And so future memory is a, a term that he used a lot. Um, and uh, um, something about that um, immense nobility of being able to walk in what many people would think of as a lion's den and to be completely at home as well as completely extraordinary um, remains with me. And I hope is one of the many ways that Willie uh, and his spirit it's a spirit lives with us. Um, another poem um, here that kind of thinks about the, the mother tongues and father languages um, that we uh, have at our, um, within our range and as part of our heritage is uh, for Ngugiwa Tiongo, uh, the Kenyan poet. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned, language is, is at the heart of the problem that this uh, book grew out of. Um, what does it mean to be speaking in and writing in English, um, which is my own language, is my own Lee language in many ways. <laughs> um, and uh, Ngugiwa Tiongo's work on decolonizing the mind and uh, writing Pikuyu um, remains a, an inspiration to try and write in the spirit of um, African languages, even when the um, vocabulary and, and lexicon is not what I work with. A Song at Dawn. Grain scatterer, we too have shed our apostolic alias and followed you into the shade to hear our voices bloom. Hear Rapoko, hear Chibage, hear Gio. Here Nzungu, here Nanga, here sweet, sweet Nopi. Here 
a name we call ourselves. Here, a thing we will not do, steal, red-handed. Grain distributor, grain distributor, we trade words with you. We give an mbeu here for a buried seed there. We mark up the goods by candlelight in blue or red ink. We shrink with doubt from a place called nation. One thing we can say for sure, we will never be a colony again. Need the obvious be stated this way? Gainsayer, what would you ask us to ask now? What is dying below the topsoil, that dusting of iron, will, nitrous rage, pot, ash? What birthright is traded when a crow lays her eggs in a crocodile's nest? What will translate this longest century into a new election cycle, a conference of women, men, young visionaries, and aging dreamers debating under Wangari's forest of green umbrellas? We will plow your plot, furrow its surface, burrow in the tunnels of language. Our dismay is our hope, present at every meeting. In simpler times, the answers might have slipped off our tongues. Now, family feuds erupt into wars. It seems these devilish thorns and eroded rock are also our inheritance. These lands, these languages, these mother tongues, you have left us no choice, O stubborn prophet of Likuyu, but to try our tongue and listen as silence softly breaks. The other poet whose um, words waft into the end of that are M. Norbesi Philip, um, whose uh, collection she tries her tongue softly um, is a, a wonderful um, premonition of what we um, more widely know through um, uh, Zong, uh, her uh, more recent poetry collection. The next poem in the collection is called Auxiliary, and it was inspired by a wonderful linguist, um, Angelika Kratze, who I had the privilege of getting to know um, when I was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute a few years ago. Um, I guess <laughs> um, there's a sub theme in my poems, which is short people power. <laughs> and Angelica was a woman of immense um, uh, erudition, is a woman of immense erudition and um, a small stature. Um, and um, I'll, I'll read the poem first and then speak a little bit about um, where it came from. Auxiliary. While it is not absolutely impossible, it is nevertheless quite unlikely that nature could construct an angel from an extant phylogeny. The back of a mammal has no pre-existing structures that can be stretched or shrunk folded or bent into a wing. These, then, are the concerns of the semanticists and their rival siblings, the syntacticians. They worry about how to swan song a boat. More precisely, they start with a boat. Take a boat in Boston, for example. Say something like swan boat but they do not suppose we all know what that is. Is it a swan boat or a swan boat? They might quibble. Then they really get going. They suggest a swan boat book and we titter with erudite delight. They keep a straight face. Well then, what about a swan boat book award? And our snobbery is further excited. Why, what would the award ceremony look like? What would we wear? Would we perhaps 
break with our own traditions and wear a dress? Would we wear a pantsuit? But who besides a Swan Boat Book awardee wears a pantsuit these days? The striding syntactician has a twinkle in her eye. Her angelic powers may be diminutive, but her impishness is palpable. And for reasons known only to her, she honors each of our traditions. Invoking Langston, she wins us over completely. This then is our best effort at last, our opening closer, a cooperative interaction, we hope in the spirit of such. We present our sister semanticist, or was she a syntactician, with this salute, a swan song after all. We hope it suits. And what Angelica did was she gave this really um, dense and um, I hate to say it uh, too confusing for me to remember <laughs> the arguments of, but a lecture on linguistics. And one of her examples was a Langston Hughes poem. And I remember feeling in this wonderfully, you know, uh, enabling space in many ways, what a stunning breath of air, not just fresh air, but breath of air it was to be in the company of someone for whom Langston Hughes was an example, a case study, the place to go in order to understand um, a human practice better. And it did, it won me over and I'm still <laughs> um, a fan of that. Um, I'm gonna go back to some visuals and this is a um, work by <clears throat> Willie Cole, the sculptor. Um, I want to pull this up on share screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we call works with um, a number of objects early on in, in the 90s. He was working with uh, um, iron prints um, and particularly with the ways in which the um, outline of a iron, a steam iron, a, a, you know, iron for clothes, but also quite powerfully of the actual pressing board um, had a similar shape to um, a, uh, a slaving ship. Um, and so he used the image of that outline in many of his works. He also used the image, um, the, the burned iron as a, um, a kind of print figure for all sorts of other um, uh, representations and abstractions. So I recommend his work to you. And I also took inspiration from it um, for a poem called Ritual Object. Through the artist's eyes, we catch this breath of fire, lifting water up to flight. This dead weight sinks our histories back into deep sleep hidden away to dream of repair. Waking, we clutch at the real weight of a movable flood, catching streams that pour through metal, still cold to the touch. Time takes little care over us. Current flowing, its song sighs across weft, warp, wrinkle, fold, it collars us in its minutiae. Iron, pierced for steam's escape, ease across what was once shift, now skirt, scarf, shirt sleeve, sheet. Form what will soon be cool, stiffen what will turn soft smooth our way and drape us in the dignity of this new day. Then I want to read two poems that respond to um, 
photographs by Robert Lyons. Um, to the page yet. Uh, I came to know of Robert Lyons's work through a collection um, of photographs um, that were published in a book called Another Africa with poems um, by Chinua Achebe um, interspersed with the photographs. Um, Achebe uh, wrote two books of poetry, He's mostly remembered for his novels, but he, he wrote these during and in the wake of the Biafran uh, war. And, uh, and then they sort of, they're, they're not that easy to find in many ways. The poems have not circulated that widely, um, although he did use them again in um, his own memoir of Biafra, um, There Was a Country. Um, but uh, I was really taken by Robert Lyons um, photographs. And so there are a couple of poems in this collection um, that respond as much to the image, well, really more to the image than to um, Achebe, because this, of course, is taken um, in what was at the time, I believe, the largest refugee camp in the world in terms of its um, uh, physical space, the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya um, in 1996. What I loved in this image was the interiority um, that was granted to this young boy um, seated here over a book. Mm. Unaccompanied minor. Stand still in the hot shade, poised, sweatless. See how the curtain sifts sand from sun through paisley print. See five orange lozenges paint light onto his profile. The thinker. Here is a boy whose thighs have outgrown him. Soon this neatly striped old navy shirt will not fit him either. Notice that his shoes are still new enough to stamp a grid on each resting place. Let sentiment blur the outlines of a rondavel through the curtain. Read a word, Mascani, stamped in stark block capitals as if on a ticket. Fuss at the curtain, a veil against flies. Count the trees here as you lean against geometry. Catch them catching the light as you square the threshold. Sense the slope of his cottoned shoulders, the dance of print on skin. Know his eyes are unquiet. What is the name of the book in his hands? his sanctums seen, that wild, unaccompanied outer world whose hem you may not mend. Camp here in this dwelling. In this image, children swings um, uh, taken in Niger, 1994. I just loved the um, all the elusiveness of this uh, empty space that was so full in so many ways. Um, three slack wooden seats bless the photographer who left out the children's bare bottoms. Against the wall, a bicycle leans. Smug and real, unwooden, unridden. Its chain is ensconced in silky blue painted metal, a yellow tangent against green bars dust. Above, the masjid's domes fade, too serene to be blue as well. 
the muezzin would spill his nasal electric currents, synthetic as wall plaster if sight were sound. Noiseless thorns and weightless leaves surveil the wall. What are they tracking? The ditch below each swing is dug patiently by the day labors of Chinese made children's shoes and patched with blunt dry thorns. The light is slant. The metal links hold fast. In this land without rain, rust harbors no intentions, peace only. Stop image there. And I'm going to read, I think, let me see here. Um, I'm going to read two poems. <laughs> One is uh, um, the closest that I came to working on my book that's in this book uh, from the National Humanities Center year. Um, I had a grant to be, I mean, I, I had applied um, and spent time working on this book on Westerns, um, cassava Westerns. And um, one of the texts in that is a beautiful film by Khalil Joseph, um, the African-American um, uh, filmmaker um, called Wildcat about a black town in Oklahoma. There are a number of historically black um, towns in various parts of the U.S., but a lot of them in Oklahoma. Um, now, um, Wildcat actually has fewer than a thousand residents in it, but this film that he made, um, uh, the town is actually now called Grayson, Oklahoma, but it was very, very moving, and I couldn't figure out how to write about it in prose. I eventually will probably have to or figure out how to convince an um, editor that, that poems are um, an idiom of thought, uh, which I I think they are, but um, but anyways, this poem was what I could say about that film. And then I'll close with um, a poem that I think pulls together some of the, the themes. I'm gonna talk about it in a second. <clears throat> Wildcat after Khalil Joseph. Cicadas echo the sha 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 that consoled the homesick. Enter the drone the presence of the present. Still here behind a veil, far from Du Bois country, grief empties a man's pockets. You hear angels when there's no one there. Through a thick lens, you spy innocence. Light resurrects her, girdles in geomancy's, sorry, girdled in geomancy's truth. Slant light slips away. What do the innocent have to do with angels? What does an angel carry in her purse? What sly joy surprises an innocent? What terror? Yesterday's flaming wood is metal now, fencing the beastly off from man. This snare, again playing black skin, once more excruciation casts the human beyond its frontier. Cowboys, grown sons of light and darkness, sorry, um, stand guard at the boundary between cattle and men. How do you turn an animal loose? Do you run alone when you run free? I am the darker brother, bordering nation, side-eyeing freedom. I am the darker brother, girding your loins with truth. Tell nothing but the whole truth, slant. Ghosts dance like this, mercifully still. Once this was Indian territory, wingless flight 
brought them here to douse the wood. The harmonies haven't changed. Remember the land, remember the body, remount the horse, get right back on the frontier. Flesh against flesh, black skin against hide. What must the innocents never know? Where they may roam and what is out of bounds. And if they lose their way, when did innocence ever kiss a black cheek? Who stands guard lest beauty, the innocence alias, give the slip? A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations, bitter consolation. The innocent are not. Angels look away. The taking is too soon. Ramallah's grief sealed off. Through this dark lens, wind cannot shield the rain's face, a blur of tears. You look like my brother, only darker. Goggle truth in this opaque vision, our only correction. Still, someone rises. Still, someone's left behind. Someone's crying. Lord, how quiet it is up in here. Feels like a ghost town. What's held is sacred. And this last poem uh, is written really about a, a, a place and a moment that doesn't exist anymore in a way. It was inspired by a newspaper article about um, the, the island of Lesbos um, uh, at a time when that was kind of, it was getting the first wave of um, refugees from the Syrian war for the most part and where other parts of Europe had really closed um, uh, down borders, um, it was still taking in um, refugees. Um, and uh, so here we have it on the Isle of Lesbos for the ones who welcomed refugees on the Aegean shores. Months later, the island's sheep shuffle, uneasy with silence. Last year, a hundred thousand voices begged to be buried here, not in Aleppo. They retched as if heaving could save them, but only thick seeds of salt spilled onto the holiday sand. Now an island man clenches his jaw. The earth holds his only daughter still. One Christmas, spasms seized her. The next, her brother shook his way to lay down beside her body below. Then this fishing man learned what grave diggers already know by doing. Only the boat's lip remained, trembling on a crest of sympathy. He moored himself in his nets, a morning hall of squid mind hope. Then the tide turned, his arms flooded full of other men's children, come to rescue him from an unfathomed ocean of grief. Mothers, mothers were caught off guard. They shepherded this off-season crowd to the guest houses, fed them used milk, took care to pay their stumps no mind. These sibyls already knew from Turk, from Greek, how opposites can hurl their waves of rage at no man's land and turn men and women to ruins. If they had it to do over again, they would and could. Now that their villages have cleared, now that the boy's photograph has won its Pulitzer and slipped our minds, 
They feel washed out. They feel their memories ebb. Their faint, faded, safic rounds must have been drowned out by Madeira's, Byron's, and Ibiza's disco scene. Once a day, a woman fights a tiny ghost toddling across the water. All that these islanders have earned is anxious rest. Not even saints stranded at home can live without bread to kiss and milk to rinse it from their lips. Thanks. Thank you so much for that uh, absolutely beautiful and, and I have to say haunting reading as well. Um, I want to ask you, I, I want to begin by asking before we get to some of the questions, you, you can hear me. Yes, yes. All right, good. All right, I will keep talking then. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you, you, said at the, you said at the very beginning all right, I, they're getting some feedback here. Hmm. Let me see if I can unmute here. All right, can you hear me now? I can. All right, good. And we don't have any feedback going on also. All right, so I wanted to ask you, I, I, you said at the beginning, you were talking about, um, you were having questions about talking so much about yourself, <laughs> but I, was struck by the fact that the title of the book is in the plural and the title poem is in the singular. Mm. And it, it's, it seems to me as I was reading these poems that yes, you're talking about yourself, but you're channeling so many other voices. Mm. And I, I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about this kind of interplay in, and detention between the singular and the plural and the self and the collective mm -hmm. in your thinking and in your work. Yeah, thank you, Robert. This is exactly why I was thrilled when I, it, I knew it was gonna be you to, to do this because I'm talking to a poet. Um, I hope that people out there know that, that you too are a poet. And, um, and it's true, the plural of mother tongues is part of my commitment to wanting to, give myself and each person permission to speak in their truest voice for whatever that moment is. I think that we live in a world of such um, uh, compulsions, often violent compulsions to conform to particular party lines, uh, sometimes really literally and, and often those shadier kind of um, ideological ones even more terrifying. So um, at a certain point as I was, you know, writing more and more poems and trying to use the noun poet to <laughs> refer to myself, I, I worried about the fact that I don't have a voice, like a single voice or a single style or a form that I, I come to. And I, I thought about the fact that I was because there's no, um, there's no um, uh, standard or 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 way in which uh, one can adopt a uniform. <laughs> you know, like th this is this is my claim to not so much opacity but unreliability. In that, on whatever day, whatever the language is that 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 day's troubles or joys or what have you demand are that thing. And it's code switching, it's bilingualism, it's passing, it's all kinds of things that one does. Um, some of which are valued and some of which are ignored. But I think about how slight the differences among the many Englishes that we hear are that at the same time, like stamp, a place, um, a sense of belonging onto um, a, a statement. And that that's malleable. Like that there are days when my 
tongue <laughs> is going to sound sort of like the British colonial version of high school that all my fellow suver survivors of Arundel um, uh, know. It, there are other days when it's going to sound um, like I was just listening to um, you know, run DMC or what have you. And yes, it's a particular path and concatenation that are my own conglomeration of those, but that's precisely it, is that each one of us has all of these tongues that are our, our own tongues. They're as much our own as any other. And yet the, the tremendous intimacy of, um, speech within the home is another thing that I'm very taken by because it has all of these public resonances and, and um, significations laid onto it, but it's just what comes out of your mouth. It was what spills out, you know? Um, and so this, this question of like, why didn't I speak Shauna better than I did? Um, I lived it as if it was this terrible private and unique guilt, guilty well, but I think pretty much anybody whose relation to language has something to do with power, um, has some sense of that. I ought to be able to speak differently than I do. And many, many people who are heritage speakers and weaker in their heritage language than in the language that they, um, they have power <laughs> really is what it is, have those, those kinds of complicated feelings. So it's sort of like, well, this happens to be my, my mother tongue. And that's why I am saying these things in this book, but any number of people might carry those same burdens. And so it's not just that I want to be able to speak in all of those tongues and all of those idioms and stylistic orientations or whatever, um, it's that I want my readers to be able to adopt any and all of those in their own, that there's this refusal of, um, of standardizing things. That's really what it is. And, you know, I mean, they, they say what, that an, a, a, dial, a language is a dialect with an army. Well, it has a flag and flags and standards are kind of not <laughs> unrelated from each other. That's standardizing, flag waving, disciplining thing, I'm not for that. <laughs> Let me go to uh, an audience, a question from a member of the audience uh, who says that uh, you write so eloquently about your parents and about other artists who inspired various uh, poems of yours and asks if you might share more about how you developed your particular poetic voice from these people and others as well. Well, I'll start with my parents. Thank you for that kind comment. Um, so uh, when I speak to my father, I, I always greet him as Majrimba Kupa and he greets me as Wanyemba. We greet each other with a poem. Majrimba Kupa is the, um, the uh, clan name for men in my totem line of the, the zebra totem. And um, it means the one who loves to give. It's part of a whole kind of poem that one says in greeting, hey, Majimba Kupa, Radiko, Maita Basa, hey, Manjin Jin Jin, and so on and so forth. You're, uh, and you praise the animal and you praise um, the characteristics of generosity, etc. cetera. Um, and um, when I was a kid, I just knew that it took forever to say hello to people. <laughs> You know, because they would, you would greet them with some snippet of the poetry, they would greet you with some snippet of the poetry. And that is just what Shona culture is. You know each other's clan greetings. Um, if you are a well cultivated person, or if you're a not so well cultivated person, such as myself, you know, a teeny bit of it, and you wish that you didn't have to sit there while the, you know, like all of the greetings went on. And I think it's such a beautiful part of. Um, a Shona way of being and one that nobody ever said to me, we live in poetry. You know, it was really only when I started teaching poetry and wanted to be able to anchor what I was saying in a history that included the, um, you know, the literatures of Africa in um, oral medias that I came to 
um, read about praise poetry and realize, oh, that's what <laughs> that's what that greeting is, you know. So, um, but I would also say that my parents really loved to sing um, and to tell stories. Um, my grandfather, uh, whenever he was visiting, so I don't have the story of like my grandmother telling me stories. She just wasn't uh, in, in Samara. She wasn't really the, the storytelling time my, my grandfather was. And I now have this three-year-old who every day I have to tell a different version of the story of the rabbit and the baboon. And I've learned <laughs> in the course of, you know, um, scores of evenings of telling the same story, how much it's actually poetry or form or craft or the you know like it's the it's a very small form a sh an oral story and so it's controlled in the same ways that your 14 lines of a sonnet or your you know 32 bar form of a jazz song that that limit is exactly what then you can kind of um rebound against so <clears throat> that's to say that um these and then the songs i mean on my mom's side my my grandfather, who was a steel mill worker in Youngstown, Ohio, would sing Tin Pan Alley songs and would adapt them um, in letters. And he was a terrible singer, <laughs> but um, he loved, um, you know, that kind of lyric and saw it as kind of leaking from um, the, the records to everyday life, you know? So I guess the... The way of being that makes all these little bits of verse of crafted saying um, available for the lived every day, I think has really influenced me in that I, when I sit down to write, I, so long as I make up my mind that I must write a poem, <laughs> I mean, like that's the hardest part is like, you must actually sit down and write. The, the sufficient disorganization of language is there to be able to let the surprises that lurk in how we say what we say when we're really trying to be honest come to the surface. And then some of that somewhere is a poem <laughs> that, you know, you kind of, I, I coax it along. I kind of edge certain things out of the way and other things, you know, get to, get to end a whole line and so on and so forth. But um, it's this, I would say that there's, um, that for me kind of, coming to grips with the lack of attention span <laughs> has been helpful in that there's, there's lots of poeming happening all around me that I catch snippets of, and those are enough to stitch together another poem. And so for when I was reading the Willy Kozitzile, I realized that I probably only know <laughs> maybe four or five friends who also love Willy um, Kozitzile's work enough to be like, oh, sanctuary. Oh, I know how you be. Oh, night, is, night time is the right time. These are like little lines in given poems that resonate because of what he was doing with seizing little bits of Black American English into his South African um, self and his human self that took on a real um, uh, you know, tingle a real kind of specialness because they stuck, stood out in a certain way. That disjuncture um, worked in how he was writing. And that, that thing, that way of how he did what he did, I think is what I was reaching for and what I remembered and felt like was accessible when I sat down to try and um, write him on his way yeah so cc we unfortunately we have run out of time but <laughs> but i want to, i want to ask you to conclude um we've talked so much about the visual in your work and we didn't even get to your wonderful van uh el greco poem yes. uh which i just adore but there's so much music 
in your book of poems and so many references from uh, Beethoven and Schumann to Miles Davis and James Brown and Martin Gay and Farrah Sanders, Mar uh, uh, and Farrah Sanders uh, et cetera. So I wonder if we can conclude um, with your poem, Flare, mm. uh, uh, to give us a little taste of Schumann in here. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Schumann is very dear to me. Um, I uh, studied his, um, Carnival Suite when I was uh, finishing up at conservatory and he was a person who lived with intensities of mood um, uh, mania and depression um, and brilliance, utter brilliance. Flair, after Robert Schumann's long gone. Every once in a while, our modern rhythms call in our bluff, that pound of flesh then we must own up to who we are. Shy, locked within our rooms, we lay us down to rest. Thank you, Tsitsi Jaje, and thanks to all of you in the audience for your interesting questions and your attendance this evening. This evening's event has been recorded and it will be available on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel please click the subscribe button and the notify bell to be notified of future discussions and other videos from the center. You may also visit nationalhumanitycenter.org to learn more about the center's work and other opportunities to explore the humanities. Good evening, everyone. Stay well.